Good morning, English 149. This is Grant. And today, we're going to be switching gears a little. And we're not really going to be talking about fan fiction. But we're going to be talking about the second feeder and your video projects. So now that you kind of have your cover art or um, your icon for your video, I mean, you're welcome to use that image for either the icon of your video or in your video. Um, but just, I just wanted to introduce you to kind of um, InDesign and um, designing, you know, visual imagery. Um, so you're welcome to continue to kind of make your own images or reuse ones from the internet for your second feeder project. But the, the really important thing is the next step is once you kind of start to grab your images, which that's what I'm going to have you do tonight, is to search for images for your feeder um, to storyboard. So you can just start thinking about are there images out there that you can use? Are you going to need to make your own images? Are you going to need to shoot your own images? Um, are you going to need to get video from somewhere? Um, so I just want you to think about what your visual content is going to look like. And then underneath each um, slide, which I'm going to go to, the feeder two. So if you go to our website underneath course requirements and feeders, you're going to see the um, our page about feeders. And so the storyboard is due Friday uh, just before midnight. And um, what I want you to do is to at least have six slides done. You might end up using more, um, but I just want at the minimum to do six. And that video storyboard link at the bottom, that um, links to a um, Word document that has a template, um, but you're more than welcome to use another t uh, template if you want uh, or another platform. I just want something that resembles a storyboard for this project. Okay. So in order to get you to think about why storyboarding is important, um, I want you to start to think about just visual rhetoric. And I think the, a good example of this is if you've ever been in a doctor's office or in a waiting room and they have a TV show on, but it's on mute. And if you're like me, I'm trying to figure out what's going on by just the imagery. And what you want to think about with that is a lot of the times the images themselves tell a story outside of how we contextualize them or um, voice them over. And so what I'm going to bring you through is... A series of images and what you want your images to do is to tell their own story and if you're really good they're going to complement the story and analysis that you're trying to tell so I'm going to show you some images here and I want you to think about what they mean okay so especially their order so, so separately, they might not say too much, but together and in that particular order, they're going to say something particular. All right. So, you know, I am a graduate student as well as a teacher. So to me, um, energy drinks are a normal part of my life. So this is, um, you know, just a standard Red Bull, um, you can think of it as one on your counter, one in your fridge, one in the uh, gas station, or one in an ad, right? So this is a Red Bull energy drink. The next image is just a Red Bull ad. And this is the way that Red Bull's been marketed for a while, right? Um, it's for athletes that do extreme things, right? It's like this skateboarder that's really going so high. I think that's from a half pipe. Okay. 
So this is a person that is at the top of their extreme sports game. And this is how they're trying to sell Red Bull. Now, later, Red Bull um, expanded themselves by saying, um, not only is Red Bull good for athletes, but it's also good for students in highly demanding professions and long drives, like a road trip or if you're a trucker. Okay, so beyond the extreme athlete, it should be used just to perform, you know, well in daily life. Okay. All right. And so this slide is the um, output of persons per hour. So this is productivity. And you can see it is on a sharp uh, increase, right, from the 50s. So over time, we're being much more productive than we used to be. Next slide. Now, this is a graph of vacation. So since 1978, we are taking... Um, now, it might not seem that much, but at scale, um, taking like seven, uh, sorry, taking three to four less days of vacation is huge. Okay, so people are taking less vacation. They're being more productive. We're trying to sell people Red Bull, something that uh, athletes are doing. Okay, and it's a product that's being sold today. All right, so these images in order, I'm trying to say something about Red Bull and our society, right? So I'm using these two graphs and I'm... Um, contextualizing them with Red Bull. Okay. So I want you to think about what I'm trying to tell you with those images, right? Okay. So think about for a second, what do you think, what do you think I'm trying to say? Okay. Am I trying to say that Red Bull, um, is a part of this gro greater trend of trying to squeeze as much productivity in people as possible? Yeah. I think um, thinking about how, you know, it's a cultural shift and now we're trying to develop products to meet that cultural shift of always working, working too much. Okay, here's another case. I'm going to go through this one a little quicker because you kind of now already have the idea. All right. So we have coffee cup. Um, you know, this is a normal one that you would see um, anywhere, right? I mean, a lot of times now we associate this with Starbucks, but um, this is a plain one. I could get this in a hotel, um, at a conference, etc. So this is what gas station coffee looks like. You know, you can see uh, lots of different options, bright red colors. Um, you can see kind of on top of the machine, it looks like there's something with a child on it. Um, but you can see just lots of options. At the end, you can see all the hostess goodies um, that aren't great for you. Okay, so this is how coffee looks like in a gas station. Now, you're familiar with this coffee cup, right? The coffee cup here, very plain, right? Instantly recognizable. And you can see how this is shot, right? Natural, good light, you know, where this is just plain. And this, you know, besides the busyness that's around the coffee, it's pretty plain. All right, so this is what a, um, you know, Starbucks typically looks like 
I'm going to call your attention to the marketing on the top right corner. Um, you can see beans, you can see fields, uh, you can see it being made into coffee, you can see the espresso, right? And a lot of times, you know, we're focused on the menu and the other stuff, but that's a part of the aesthetic of Starbucks is this whole kind of farming to ex espresso. So this is what a Starbucks looks like. This is a picture of um, a Guatemalan farmer. Okay. This is um, the increase in demand and sales for fair trade coffee. I mean, we also have bananas and other things, but you can see there's a there's a huge increase, um, probably starting around two thousand five where we really want more fair trade coffee. Now, while fair trade coffee's increased, um, there's also been an increase in the price of coffee. Okay. And, you know, you can kind of see that trend start where we're talking about fair trade in 2005. Right, so coffee is getting more expensive. We demand more fair trade coffee, etc. Starbucks. Okay, so I want you to think about those images together, right? Like I'm giving you information and visuals in different forms to get you to think about what I'm trying to say, right? There's gas station coffee, which you probably don't visit. It's cheap. Um, Starbucks expensive and probably fair trade. Um, so what am I trying to say there? Well, my uh, best friend, Zizek, would often say about Starbucks that you feel good buying Starbucks coffee because you know the extra money you spend on it will go to Guatemalan farmers. So he's saying that the reason why we're okay with spending five to six dollars on a coffee drink, where we could be, you know, going to the gas station and getting a very similar product for um, maybe half or a third of the price, is we feel okay with spending that extra money because it's going to go to someone else. Okay. So I took this analysis by Zizek and tried to put it into a visual narrative. So that's what I want to think you to think about when you're doing a storyboard is what the images tell you outside of how you contextualize them. Okay. So I also have these next slides posted as a GIF under the feeder. Um, feeder page, but I'm just going to go over these briefly now. So you can think about a storyboard um, as a sketch of how to organize a story and a list of its contents, much in the same way as you would outline in a traditional paper. A storyboard serves as a um, multimodal outline. So you can use it to outline things um, that are visual and textual in nature. Okay. So there's good storyboards and there's not good storyboards, right? Um, this storyboard here, you know, we could, we typically would read things as we would uh, a normal book, right? Left to right, top to bottom. So if you read this, you know, what are you thinking of? What do you think is happening? Right. It's kind of confusing. Um, and this is, happens a lot, but this is when a director really makes um, the storyboard because it's kind of confusing. They're, they're more interested in the shots and not necessarily telling a narrative. But this is generally how a storyboard looks. I'm going to be asking you to do something a little different 
um, I'm going to be asking you to put some text, just some points. They don't have to be complete sentences under each of the images, just so I, you can think about what you're going to say with those images. But what you should do first is just put the images all in play and see what kind of story. Like if it's confusing story, is there another image? Can you take something away? Because maybe in this aspect, if we took away maybe three of the images, it might make more sense. So I really want you to think about what story does the sequence of your images? What, what story does it make? So this is an example from um, Ken Burns' documentary about the Civil War. And um, I've tried to, he uses different um, sized images. So, um, you know, what, what story is he trying to tell, you know, with, um, with the, these kind of images? And you can tell, right, you have those first two images and then you have the image of a person. And so you can tell the way that Ken Burns does these documentaries is the archive that he's dealing with is letters. So he's talking about, you know, the Civil War and kind of some of the destruction that happened. And then he's pointing to, well, I know this from this letter. And he reads it and there's a description, right? And so you can think about like the order and how you're going to tell the story might matter, right? If you want to switch perspectives, like how do you visually tell us that you're switching perspectives? And you can do that by focusing on a single character. All right. And so some of my work in the William Blake archive, uh, we do a lot of digital exhibits. And so you can think of digital exhibits um, in much of the same way, right? Like um, every paragraph is going to have a particular point. And can we make that point both textually and then help it out with a visual element, right? And this is where composing on the internet has its advantages is I don't need to make just Word documents now. I can make visual and words together. Okay. So typically this is how I want your, um, storyboards to look. So there should be like, you know, give your project a name for now. Um, it can definitely change, but it's always nice to try and title it. A, a lot of you actually already worked on that in the last feeder, but continue that same, um, title or if you want a new one you can do that too um, but put in your images here or you could just give me the url to link to them or you know you could say i'm going to draw something and this is what i'm going to draw um, or i haven't found this um, but i'm going to try and find it later um, you know that's what i have you doing tonight so you're kind of prepared to do this on friday